Good afternoon, folks. Uh, my name is Ben Jessam. I'm the chair on the Standing Committee on Health, and I'd like to call today's meeting of the Standing Committee on Health to order. Uh, today we're going to hear from three guests related to Ronald McDonald House Charities Atlantic and their role in our community. A uh, quick reminder, folks, turn off your cell phones or put them on silent. Um, in the case of an emergency, we'll head out these doors in front of me to your right Grand, onto Granville Street and then down to the Art Gallery. Um, anybody who is not actively speaking, we ask that you keep your mask on uh, during the course of the meeting. Uh, at about 2 o'clock or uh, uh, shortly after our first round of questioning, uh, we'll take a brief recess for about 15 minutes. Uh, we'll be required to extend the meeting about 15 minutes if I have the agreement of members of the committee. Thank you. Uh, so we'll now commence with some introductions, beginning with uh, Mr. Horn. Please and thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome to the legislature. My name's Bill Horn. I'm MLA for Waverly Fall River Beaver Bank. Hi, I'm Margaret Miller, the MLA for Hans East. Good afternoon, Keith Irving, MLA for King South. Good afternoon, I'm Barbara Adams, the MLA for Coal Harbor Eastern Passage. Hi there, I'm Susan LeBlanc, MLA for Dartmouth North. Good morning, oh, good afternoon, uh, Kendra Coombs, Cape Breton Center. Good afternoon, welcome, Colton LeBlanc, MLA for Argyle Barrington. Welcome, Rafa Di Costanzo, MLA for Clayton Park West. Excellent, thank you, folks. Uh, so I will now invite um, our witnesses to introduce themselves. Uh, actually, before I do that, uh, I just wanted to mention, so as, as has been the practice with this committee, we will move uh, in sequence of Progressive Conservative Caucus, NDP Caucus, uh, to Liberal Caucus with 20, round, 20 minutes each. Uh, allotted for questionings in the first round, and then based on the time uh, left over, uh, it will be divided equally in that same order. Um, I think that's it for housekeeping, so without further ado, I'll invite our guests, beginning with Ms. Barker, to introduce themselves and make their opening remarks. Please and thank you. Hi, Lori Barker, CEO with Ronald McDonald House Charities Atlantic. Leanne Ward, Family Services Manager of Ronald McDonald House Charities Atlantic. Good afternoon, Matt Gamble. I'm the Vice Chair of the Board of Directors for Ronald McDonald House Atlantic. I'm also the Director of Strategy and Performance at the IWK Health Center. So I'll now invite um, Ms. Barker to make some opening remarks, please and thank you. Thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to come and speak with you today about our organization. Um, I'd like to start just by thanking all of you for the great work that you do on behalf of Nova Scotians each and every day. I know this has been a very challenging time, but uh, on behalf of our organization and certainly individually, just want to thank you for the leadership you've brought to the province. As far as Ronald McDonald House Charities Atlantic, I wanted to take a few minutes today to share a bit of an overview of what we do as an organization and the impact we have on our community here in the Maritimes and including Nova Scotia, of course, and then also talk about our plans for the future. We have some really exciting developments I'm sure many of you have heard a little bit about, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that today too. So we've been in the community since 1982, supporting maritime families with sick children, and essentially we we are a home away from home for those families that need to travel to access medical care for their sick child. And we do that through two key programs. The first is Ronald McDonald House, and that's our more well-known uh, program, and that's located on Tower Road. And on any given night, we can have up to 18 families stay with us. Of course, that is not during the pandemic, that is during normal times. And on any given year, we would have about 600 families uh, from throughout the Maritimes actually staying with us. To give you a sense of the importance of the work that we do. Um, we certainly exist to alleviate a lot of financial pressure for families. Uh, so for most families, we understand it through an economic impact report that by staying at the house, they would otherwise um, be facing costs of about $272 a day. 
And with an average stay over the course of a year of seven nights, that's almost $2,000. So you can imagine the strain that that puts on a family dealing with a sick child, uh, let alone when they're staying for a month or two. And the other side of the um, work that we do is really about providing emotional support to families. So again, you can appreciate when families are um, brought from Cape Breton unexpectedly, or they're having to spend a lot of time here in Halifax at the IWK Health Centre, they're away from their support networks, their family, their friends, their neighbours, and so we really step in to provide that emotional support to them. They connect with other families who are on similar journeys. They connect with our staff, with our volunteers, and that really is the priceless aspect of what we do as an organization. We also have another program, and that's called the Ronald McDonald Family Rooms. So it's a little less known, but it's space within the IWK Health Center, as well as space within the Moncton Hospital. And the work that we do there is really about providing a break from the hospital room, a, a bit of an escape from the beepers and the buzzers and the clinical settings where families can enjoy just a cup of coffee, maybe have a shower, do laundry. And at the IWK Health Center, our family room also has three overnight stays. So for the most critical of cases, our families are able to stay right in the hospital and be very close to, uh, to their children. The family rooms, you might be surprised to learn that they receive upwards of 40,000 visits a year between those two spaces. So very well used um, space without a doubt. And of course, as you can appreciate, we wouldn't be able to do what we do without the support of our volunteers. Uh, on any given year, we have fundraising staff, we have volunteers at the house helping with our program delivery. And last year, we had about 2,000 volunteers that contributed 19,000 hours of volunteer service. So without them, we would not be able to do what we do. And then of course, our wonderful donors that uh, help provide funding to support our ongoing operations. So where we are today as an organization, in recent years, we have continued to see uh, an incline around the demand for our services, and we've unfortunately, over the years, had to turn away many families who have been calling on us for support. We also, in our 100-plus-year-old building, have a lot of limitations in our current space. We aren't a fully accessible building, which is incredibly important given the population we serve. Um, we aren't able to accommodate children with compromised immune systems because we have shared washrooms in our current space, and that poses too high of a risk. Um, and we aren't as prepared for public health crisis as we would like to be. So that is another element that has come into, you know, our, our awareness certainly in recent months. The other big piece is we are in a house that was built for a single family. So if you can imagine the space you have for your kitchen and dining room and living room, that is what we have at Ronald McDonald House. Only we have 18 families using that space. So we like to use words like intimate and charming, <laughs> um, but it, it can be intense and a bit chaotic. And, and we want to be able to provide a more restful environment for our families and more options uh, and space for us to be able to provide the important programming um, that is available and that should be available to help those families through their journey. So as a result of all of that, we've had a lot of consultation with our board and certainly with our partners at the IWK. And the decision was made to build a new house, um, both to address the, the wait list and the families returning way, but also just to ensure we're providing the best quality experience to the families who are staying with us. So we're going from an 18-bedroom facility to a 36-bedroom house. It will double the capacity and double the number of families that we can support. And when you translate that into the number of overnight stays, it's more than 6,500 additional overnight stays we'll be able to provide to those families who call Ronald McDonald House home. So you can imagine there is an investment required for a project of this magnitude. Um, we are very grateful to the provincial governments that have stepped forward and certainly to the Government of Canada for investing. And we are looking at a private sector fundraising campaign that's being led by some community leaders, amazing community leaders from throughout the region um, under Scott McCain and his partner, Leslie McLean, who are really leading the charge to help advance those efforts. So exciting times ahead. That gives you, in a nutshell, uh, who we are and what our future plans are. And at this time, I guess we open the floor to questions. Any other comments you want to add, Leanne or Matt? Okay. Thank you so much, Ms. Barker. Ms. Adams is going to kick us off for the Progressive Conservatives' uh, first 20 minutes. Ms. Adams. Well, thank you very much, all of you, for being here this afternoon. My very first memory is being four years old and in the children's hospital, not able to walk for two weeks because I had purpura. 
And I recall the three children who were with me in the same room being terrified every night when our parents left that they weren't coming back to get us. Um, so fortunately, I'm from Metro, so I didn't have that issue. So I cannot imagine what it would be like for any family to have to go home and leave their child um, without them. So we're extremely grateful for all that you do and all that the volunteers do. I mean, 19,000 hours, that is outstanding. Um, so thank you all for what you do, um, and especially during this past year. Um, you mentioned at the very beginning, um, uh, Ms. Barker, about uh, having to turn families away. And I'm just wondering if you could give us a number of how many referrals you get um, and then how many have to be turned away each year, right at the moment. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Ms. Barker, please. Uh, so right at the moment, it's an interesting time. Uh, we are dealing with pandemics, so our house is actually down to nine bedrooms as far as operating capacity, and we are seeing a lot less visits to the IWK right now as far as need with uh, everything that's happening in the environment around us. So, you know, when we look back a couple of years ago, we might have had 300 uh, nights where we would be turning away families uh, in the run of a year. And so that demand, you know, as we look at more outpatient care, as we look at shorter homes, hospital stays. It has all contributed to, you know, an increased demand on those services. But more than that, as I said, you know, a lot of it is about the limitations of the old house that we're in. So it's about the quality of the stay that we're able to provide. Um, shared washrooms isn't what we want to be providing families who are, you know, in the middle of very significant crises in their lives. Um, but Leanne, do you have anything else to add around the, the numbers and where we are? Ms. Uh, Ward, please. Certainly. Um, when it comes to, it, it is very difficult as we look at pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. Um, Pre-pandemic, certainly we can provide confirmation of stats on the number of families we turned away, but it's oftentimes families that are, um, that are feeling that they do not wish to stay with us because their child may not have as severe of an illness as someone else and taking away a room from a more critical or more ill patient. So certainly the statistics that we have available to us um, give us the number that we've physically told that we cannot but we know that there are some families that are actually self-determining um, that they're choosing not to stay with us because they may have a short-term stay uh, they may not be traveling as far as families from you know the the edges of Cape Breton or from northern New Brunswick so there's a certain guilt associated to that we want to ensure that we are as available and as accommodating to any immunocompromised patients any of those with with accessibility or disability needs, or those that may only be a two hours away versus those that may be eight hours away. Thank you, Ms. Ward. Ms. Adams, please. Thank you very much. And just in terms of the distance away, um, I th can you remind us again how far you have to live away in order to be eligible? And, and I wanted to ask whether that was given COVID-19, where some people may be having to take the bus into town, whether there's been any thought to reducing the distance away that would allow you to take advantage of your services. Thank you, Ms. Ward, please. Thank you for asking that question because it is something that for us, um, we have uh, a discretionary rule which is uh, typically 80 kilometers away. Um, however, as the family services manager on a case by case basis, if there is a patient that is very critical, um, even being 15 to 20 kilometers away can present a real emotional stress on a family. So for us, um, we typically say 80 kilometers. However, we have that discretionary ability to review on a case by case basis, which we do quite often. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Adams, please. Thank you very much. Um, that's good to hear. Um, so we, of course, uh, the PC party are highly in support of virtual care and would extend it permanently for physicians in the province of Nova Scotia. Um, we're wondering how the access to virtual care during the pandemic has actually reduced perhaps the need for children to travel into the IWK for care and whether virtual care has in fact reduced the demand on your services right now. Do you have any sense of whether that's um, something that has changed the demand for your services? Ms. Barker, please. It is something. 
we're monitoring very closely. You can imagine our partnership with the IWK. We're wanting to work hand in hand and make sure that an investment in a building that we are looking at is going to be well used, certainly in the future. And from what we can tell at this time, it will be. Um, in the earlier numbers, when we looked at the medical feasibility study with the IWK Health Center, it actually deemed that we could be building a facility upwards of 50 some rooms. And when we looked at the financial um, sustainability and the capital required to build a, room, a, a house of that that size, we didn't feel that that was the most fiscally responsible move. If we were moving forward with a 50 plus bedroom house at this time, we would be more concerned to your point. Um, but given the demand that is being projected at this point, even with virtual care, we feel very confident that a 36 bedroom house will be filled. We also know that the improvement in the quality of stay will drastically increase the number of families who are going to want to be staying with us and feel comfortable in that space. But Matt, would you like to comment a bit more with the IWK lens? Mr. Campbell, please. The que Thank you for the question. Um, so alongside the many challenges that COVID-19 has presented um, the healthcare system and, and society in general, it, it as well um, accelerated opportunities uh, to your point with respect to virtual care. Um, the IWK um, fully embraced the opportunity um, to offer virtual care services to our patients and families um, throughout the pandemic. Um, I'd like to highlight our mental health and addictions program that uh, stepped in very, very uh, quickly to be able to do that and, and, and for the most part did not realize an impact to service delivery um, over that course in time. Um, that being said, um, that change did come quickly and so we are navigating the um, challenges along the way as we move from kind of a, a short-term solution to what does this look like uh, sustainably in the long term for both the IWK and for the health system in Nova Scotia. So we're working alongside our, our government and uh, Nova Scotia to health partners uh, to identify what those opportunities are. I know at the IWK um, there are some programs where we've seen the sustainability of virtual care um, service delivery trends uh, since the start of the pandemic. There are other services where we saw a, a, an increase in those virtual care visits that has declined slightly as we've resumed more normal operations over the past four to six months. Um, we have an internal steering committee in place that is looking to identify what the long-term strategy with respect to virtual care and digital transformation will be. I, again, we do that in, col in collaboration with our system partners and uh, look forward to the opportunities that a potential OPOR strategy, one person, one record strategy would bring forward uh, in terms of virtual care delivery as well. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Ms. Adams, please. Thank you very much and, and I'm really glad that you have an internal health committee looking at virtual care because we had suggested at um, the last committee meeting when we met with Doctors Nova Scotia that there be uh, to match the national task force on virtual care that we have a provincial task force on virtual care. So we're still promoting that concept. Um, we are quite sure that you all have a very close relationship with the family members of the children who are in need of care. And I'm just wondering if you have sensed uh, a shift in some of the concerns that they might express to you because I know you're you're helping to support them financially over their stay in terms of um, uh, the location of them but I'm wondering whether you're hearing about other increasing challenges that they might be facing back home like um, increasing rents uh, lack of affordable housing um, loss of income because of COVID-19 and the increased cost of food and medication. And I'm just wondering if they're expressing those concerns, if they're different than what you heard perhaps a year ago, and then how does your organization help advocate or link them to resources in their communities to help with those other costs that are also um, associated with looking after a child who's sick? Ms. Ward, please. Thank you for the question. Um, certainly families are, are very upfront and very much communicative with us because we become such an intimate part um, of their experience and they tend to share um, some insights into what 
stress and struggles um, either pre-pandemic or you know in the current times. Um, certainly for us, we are always looking, depending on um, where they are coming from throughout the Atlantic province, provinces, to really ensure that they are aware of what local resources that they have available to them. And that, that very much does vary based on the families that are coming to us. Um, certainly we deal with families outside of the maritime provinces as well, given um, the facility uh, that is closest to us being the IWK and the experts uh, and expertise that they provide. So we, we're dealing with families that are outside of that maritime bubble as well. So wanting to ensure that they are aware of what local supports they have. Um, also to ensuring that they're communicating with their IWK social worker. Um, there is a phenomenal team of social workers at the IWK that provide a lot of those directives as to what local supports are available for them. Um, in addition, families very much do share on a personal level what strains and stresses that they're under um, when it comes to having to leave, uh, leave their hometown in order to be in the city. Um, a lot of those challenges are very unique to those specific families, whether or not they have additional supports and, and families um, around who can alleviate some of that, that, that burden when it comes to um, additional groceries. Uh, Childcare is a huge component. Um, when it comes to the ins and outs of their personal finances, um, I think families keep that information pretty close to the chest because that's um, that's th that lays them pretty bare. Um, so unfortunately, I can't necessarily provide direct response to whether or not they're concerned about rental increases and lack of affordable housing. Um, that's not something that families are necessarily communicating to us. Uh, Ms. Barker would like to chime in here as well, please. Just one comment to share, so thank you for that, Leanne. Um, families who stay at the house are asked to contribute uh, $11 per night, so you know that is part of the process. That said, we never turn away any families. What is important to note, I think, from a numbers perspective is that last year alone, about 39% of our families were not in a position to cover that cost. 39%. So if that gives you a sense of scale as to the need and the, the financial stresses in these families' lives, I think that that would speak to that. Ms. Adams, with just about eight minutes left, please. I just have one more question, then I'm going to pass it over to my colleague. Um, you mentioned that um, you could probably use even more beds than the 50. So I'm just wondering what, with the hopeful increase in population in our province, over the next 10 or 20 years, um, what your projections are in terms of the need for beds that you're going to need um, over the next um, two decades, um, because we we have a you know an expectation sometimes that we're meeting the demand now, but if we're just going to meet that now and then five years from now we're going to need another house, um, do you already know that? And in, if that's the case, what number are you expecting we might need five, 10, and 20 years from now? Miss Barker. So we are looking at a 36 bedroom house um, at this time and it is an interesting dance we are doing much like the dance you all are as far as understanding how this pandemic will unfold. Um, as mentioned, the IWK is doing some great work around virtual care. And so as we look to the demand in the future, what we have seen across the country is when other houses have been built at other chapters, within 10 to 20 years, there is often a need to expand the service offerings. Whether that will happen here in light of the virtual care increases, we might actually stay neutral and not need to expand in 10 to 20 years. If we do need to expand though, we've worked with the architects so that the actual design elements uh, we'll have the foundation in the building so that we can add more floors on uh, very easily as we move forward in time. Mr. LeBlanc with six minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our witnesses for joining us this afternoon. And uh, thank you for the mon monumental role that you play in the lives of so many Nova Scotians and Atlantic Canadians, particularly over the last uh, few challenging months. Um, so to your staff and to your volunteers for that, uh, the, the ability of creating that home away from home, thank you. Um, I want to dive in a little bit into um, the project uh, cost itself. So it's an $18.76 million uh, build, uh, quite significant. Uh, since COVID, we've seen that the cost of some building materials have inflated exponentially. So like for a 10 foot two by four, it's almost $10. Um, so have the cost been reflected uh, in that, uh, in the in the price of the build, or are there modifications to be made? Thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. Miss Barker, please. 
We are closely monitoring this. Matt, you might want to add a comment from the board after. Um, in the spring, when we went and did a, a further cost estimate to really make sure that we were reflecting at least the point in time at, uh, at that stage, we knew we needed to make design changes, and we did um, to find cost uh, efficiencies in that. We have a new house committee comprising experts in the community, developers, project managers, architects, who are really advising us. We are great at community engagement and taking care of families, building a 40,000 square foot home. Uh, has not been our bailiwick. So we've surrounded ourselves with people who are experts in that field. Um, we're working through the design development right now with the architects, and we'll go back for another cost estimate in the fall. So we are, we are monitoring it closely. Uh, it is a concern, without a doubt. Uh, so we will see where that um, costing unfolds in the coming months. But we have already made our first shift to maintain those costs. Matt, anything else? Thank you. Mr. Campbell would like to jump in here as well, please. Hi, thank you for the question. Um, the board uh, in its oversight capacity has tremendous confidence in the processes that we have, um, that Lori and team and others in the cabinet have put in place in terms of the experts that have been brought in to help guide um, this transformational uh, initiative uh, for both the province of Nova Scotia and, and surrounding maritime uh, communities. Um, that being said, we do recognize um, that these these past uh, number of months has have placed pressures um, in the uh, in the building and construction sector. Uh, personally, I'm in the process of building a new house and have realized that firsthand. <laughs> and uh, as Lori indicated, um, as we continue to consult with these experts, uh, the board is aware um, that the process is ongoing, and if the time, if it becomes necessary, uh, we will have the discussion to revisit um, the the overall capital cost and what does that mean from our capital campaign goal um, that we have set um, and have had tremendous success with um, to date. So it's something we're keenly aware of, and we'll continue to have uh, oversight of on uh, at a governance level. Thank you. Recognize Mr. LeBlanc, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the response, and I hope for you personally, for the thousands of Nova Scotians who are maybe in a similar predicament that the price of lumber will go down as, uh, as we deal with this pandemic. Um, regarding the funding received um, from, from governments, uh, both at a national and provincial level, have there been any restrictions um, placed on these funds on what you can do with the funding and what you cannot do if it's designated for a certain element of the project or not? Ms. Barker. Uh, no, the scope of the project is really about creating and increasing our programmatic uh, space and ability to accommodate more families, and that is the stipulation that's been placed around those funds. If we go outside of that, we will need to revisit discussions naturally with those funding bodies, but they understand the, the scope of which, uh, which these funds are to be used for. Mr. LeBlanc, with two minutes. Thank you. Um, so there's two provinces, Atlantic provinces, that haven't uh, either committed to date any funding. Have they been consulted or have they offered any, any uh, insight of whether they'd be supporting this project as well? Ms. Barker. Oh, just to clarify, Ronald McDonald House Charities Atlantic, um, despite its name, we primarily focus on supporting maritime families. Uh, the Newfoundland has the Janeway Hospital and they have their own Ronald McDonald House. So we will not be approaching the Newfoundland government for support of this project. Um, despite the fact we do have a number of Newfoundland families who stay here. Uh, that said, we do have um, one pending uh, announcement that might happen in the coming <laughs> weeks and months. Uh, so stay tuned on that front. But what I can say is we are very grateful um, for the support all around that we have received from our friends in government. Mr. LeBlanc. Thank you. Uh, and I guess I'll just wrap up this line of uh, this round of questioning regarding the number of families that you welcome from the Atlantic or more, maybe more so the maritime uh, provinces um, based on, on their, their needs uh, here in, in the uh, Halifax region. I guess is there a particular number by geographic region uh, of the populations that you uh, that you support? Ms. Barker. When we look at our programs, including the two family rooms and the house, about half of the families would come from New Brunswick, uh, about 35% would be Nova Scotian, about 10% from Prince Edward Island, and that can go up one or two points or down in any given year, and then the remainder would be predominantly Newfoundland, but we do sometimes have families from outside the region, even St. Pierre and Mekalong, we've had families from, uh, from that region as well. Cool. Well, Mr. Le Mr. LeBlanc? 
Thank you, and uh, just for, do for essence of time. Uh, I'm not going to pose any questions uh, for the remainder of this round, so thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. We're going to move to the NDP caucus for 20 minutes, beginning with Ms. Coombs. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Um, I'd like to begin with saying how important and needed the service of Ron McDonald House are. Um, and I know your organization changes the lives of many families. And I'm sincerely looking forward to hearing more about the work from the Ron McDonald House and that which you do. Um, however, and although this is an important topic, I'm sure you'll understand my dismay that during a global pandemic, um, a global health emergency with an unprecedented democratic deficit within with the Liberals have prevented committees from meeting through the first wave of this virus, um, the Liberals did not choose to discuss long-term care, public health measures, mental health, or any of the significant impacts of COVID-19 at the health committee meeting today. However, with that all being said, I do want to hear about the important work that you're doing. And this kind of falls into one of the questions I have is on paid sick leave. And this kind of falls into what COVID-19 has highlighted. And that is how many families um, who use your services have access to paid time and, the Im and what are the impact of income loss for parents who take on paid leave due to illnesses of their children? Ms. Ms. Barker, please. Sorry. Uh, that is something we could follow up with you on. Um, we don't track specific data uh, at Ronald McDonald House Charities Atlantic as to the number of families um, with us on any given year who are dealing with loss of income or what the degree of that loss of income can be. Um, I know that great organizations like the Canadian Cancer Society, Heart and Stroke, they do manage that data when it comes to uh, dealing with various diseases and the impact that that has on family, both with respect to cost of medication as well as the caregiver role that families have. So uh, we could certainly follow up with some resources in that respect, but that isn't a primary focus of the data we collect. Ms. Coombs, please. Thank you. I know, I know that you just said that you don't have the data. Uh, I'm just wondering, anecdotally, like through people having those conversations with you, um, have they talked about paid sick time and what it would mean if these families had it, you know, through conversations? Ms. Ward, please. It's not a topic that is often brought to light. Um, and I think a lot of it is because of the fact that um, we already have such intimate knowledge and details of that family dynamic and current and, and, and the child's current illness. Um, and the, dis and the, the topic and, and discussion of finances is one that we try and avoid having with families simply because we want to ensure that regardless of their capacity to cover the $11 nominal fee that we ask for per night, we want to ensure that any family feels appropriate um, to stay with us regardless of their capacity to cover that expense. Um, and typically, in the event that a family does bring that to light, we want to ensure that they're dealing with their community support worker uh, as well as their social worker to ensure that all available funds and programs for them are made accessible to them. Thank you, Ms. Ward. Ms. Coombs, please. Uh, thank you. Just, um, I'm going to switch gears here. Uh, I know the Department of Community Services does provide some support based on need to clients who need to travel for, child, for ch their child's treatment. And I've heard that in some cases, the assistance is not adequate as it should be. And that leaves families scrambling to pay for travel, meals, accommodations. I'm wondering if you could talk about the support available from the Department of Community Services and whether you're aware of this problem. Ms. Ward, please. Certainly we are um, on a limited basis aware of what those supports are through the different provinces for the families that we deal with. Um, that being said, we are not experts um, in that area and we are always having uh, referring families back to that, that expert so that they can provide the necessary guidance based on what available programs um, for that specific family based on their family dynamic and circumstances. And again, for us, we always uh, want to ensure that we are never passing judgment on families and what their financial status may be um, by, by, di by discussing um, things that are outside the scope of what our mission is. Ms. Coombs, please. Uh, thank you very much. I'll pass this off to my colleague. Thank you very much, Ms. Adams. Or Ms. Le Ms. LeBlanc, excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> um, 
thank you very much for being here. I just, uh, some of these uh, questions that I have are ones that are like sort of secondary questions to things you've already been talking about, and then I have a couple of other ones. Um, so first I wanted to ask, I wanted to follow up on Mr. LeBlanc's uh, no relation um, question about um, uh, places where the geographic locations where people come from. So within Nova Scotia, where, where do you see families coming from the most? Do you have that kind of data? Like is it Cape Breton, is it? Valley. Ms. Barker, please. So on any given year, that can change significantly. You know, one family can come from a certain region and stay with us for three months. So the number of nights that we might see from that family would be heavily skewed to that region in any given year. Um, I do have some information I can leave with you uh, that really demonstrates every county, every corner of Nova Scotia, every corner of the Maritimes for that matter, would have families staying with us. Um, if we look at the Cape Breton region in particular, last year alone there were 533 overnight stays by Cape Breton families. Um, so, you know, there is definitely support needed from throughout the region. Like I said, though, that can change in any given year for each region. Thank you, Ms. Barker. Ms. LeBlanc. Um, thanks. And um, so when families come to stay, if they have kids of school age that aren't the sick child, but the family members, is there, are there tutoring services for those kids? Or how do families function in that way? How does that all work? Ms. Ward, please. Again, based on uh, our limited capacity in our communal spaces, we've not been previously able to provide a tutoring service. And that certainly is one of the topics of discussion for new programs that we may be able to provide. Um, we are very lucky in the fact that a number of our volunteers have expressed interest, given um, the wonderful community of university students that we have here in the Halifax region. Um, we have so many um, social sciences students, uh, art students, as well as medical sciences. Um, and those are the students that are very eager to get involved uh, and would love to provide that type of volunteer capacity um, to provide uh, some tutoring services. So up to this point, um, we've not been able to do that, but it's something that we're, a topic that we're discussing. Um, oftentimes what you will see, and this is again one of the privileges that I get to experience as a, as a staff member, is um, seeing the firsts for children that are staying at our house, whether they are the patient or the sibling of a patient, um, them taking their first steps. Um, going up the stairs for the first time, learning how to read by, um, you know, those nightly bedtime stories that are ha either happening in our living room or in some of our more um, intimate spaces. Um, so presently, it is very much a one-on-one -on -one basis, and it is something that, that parents take on, in addition to support or resources they would have through the IWK. Thank you. Ms. LeBlanc, please. Thank you. Um, so you will know just from if 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 you have an experiences with the families that you're working with, but f from the news um, that with the, during the first wave of COVID-19, um, many hospital procedures were cancelled or delayed, and you've spoken to that that you've had less uh, less people coming through because less stuff is going on at the IWK. But those cancelled procedures have caused significant backlogs and um, long waiting lists. So I'm wondering if you can speak to the impact that that's having on the families that you're serving at the Ronald McDonald House. Um, yeah, anecdotally, I guess. Ms. Ward. Um, certainly we have seen some modifications to stay requests that we have for families that are coming up in the future. We'll take requests up to a year in advance. Um, however, based on the ever-changing needs of our families, we're only confirming that 24-hour period prior to their stay with us. Um, so based on that, what we're seeing is a lot of modifications, and that may be due to the health and wellness of, uh, of a family member or a child in that they're not feeling well enough to travel um, to the IWK for symptoms that they may have. So I can't necessarily speak to um, those delays and rebooking. Certainly from our perspective, what we are still seeing is that um, there is still access to care and there's just a different level of access based on the different variations of care that they can receive, whether it's in person or via telehealth. Thank you. Ms. LeBlanc. Thanks. And so are you anticipating, given that your numbers have been down during the pandemic, are you anticipating that uh, 
if and when and if things get back to normal, that um, yeah, thanks. Um, that there'll be you will have you'll be turning away more families than usual because you won't have the new building up yet or, or whatever. That that your capacity there'll be more demand for your capacity because there's more stuff going on again. Uh, and if so, um, are, what are and and this is sort of a, that's a but also. Um, if so, but also, second question, uh, is what happens when you turn people away? What other resources do families have? Um, are there, you know, do you have deals with hotel rooms where, where they're um, subsidized or anything like that for people to go if there's no room at, at your house? Thank you, Ms. Ward. Um, certainly, we are referring to other local um, accommodations that are low cost, um, but always referring them back to their point of contact when it comes to their social worker, whether it be a local or their hospital social worker, to ensure that they are accessing any discounted rates that the IWK may have. Um, but for us, what we want to ensure is that we are accommodating as many people as safe um, to do so in this particular time. So for us, we're looking at new and different and unique ways of trying to create those different families bubbles within our house environment now um, and constantly looking at the number of, uh, of active cases, the number of potential exposures and how we're screening our families when it comes to ensuring that we're at a maximum capacity based on our COVID-19 protocols. Ms. LeBlanc with about nine minutes to go. Nine minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, um, sorry. So, yeah, so stressful episodes in families' uh, lives are helped immeasurably by the services that you provide. Um, we've heard a little bit about that already, and, uh, you know, I can only imagine um, how important the work you're doing is um, to those families. Um, shelter and accommodations are maybe the most fundamental challenge that families experience. And I just actually on that, I wanted to clarify something you just said. Um, people can book up to a year in advance, but are you saying their, their booking is not confirmed until 24 hours before the date? Because that feels very stressful, <laughs> the idea that they might not have a place to stay. Ms. Ward. Yes. So because for us and the families that we are supporting, for example, today, they may not know when they can leave. They're, they're being evaluated on a daily basis, and we will never ask a family who is currently staying with us to leave. So that puts us in a, in a challenging predicament when it comes to families that are looking to come and stay with us. We always suggest families have a backup option whenever they've, they've requested to stay with us. Um, if they're coming for, let's just say, a month long, Long stay and we're not able to accommodate them on the first night that they're here we're looking to accommodate them as soon as we have a room that opens up um, but for us we want to ensure that the families that are currently staying with us are not feeling pressured or rushed to leave earlier than their their anticipated length of stay is is expecting to end um, but it, it certainly it, it is a, a challenge that we have experienced and, and we are constantly doing everything possible to accommodate the greatest and and highest priority of critical patient, um, but looking to ac accommodate as many families as possible. Ms. LeBlanc. Yeah, thanks. So I'm wondering, um, some, I have some specific questions about how families do manage those challenges and that, and that stress um, uh, around accommodations, but also the other things aside from accommodations. Uh, and some of this stuff you may, we may have already asked, or various people may have asked, and, uh, but I'm just going to ask in a different way, maybe, um, I'm not sure how much you'll be able to, to offer. But, um, can, so can you talk about, you've already talked about this, actually, the financial challenges. So you don't, would you agree with this, with me saying that you don't really get into the weeds about families' financial challenges? Ms. Ward. Yes, agreed, we do not. Ms. Okay. Um, LeBlanc, please. Thanks. What about families who don't have access to a vehicle to get to the city or to get to uh, Nova Scotia? Do you know if there are supports available in terms of transportation or public transit for them to actually arrive for their services? Ms. Ward, please. 
Because we're dealing with families coming from a variety of provinces and areas, um, I can't say across the board that there is consistent coverage. It is very unique um, to each province. And, and again, for us, we'll, we're always referring families back to, um, to their community social worker to ensure that they're accessing those resources. Ms. Barker, please. We also do connect them with other great resources in the community. So as much as we are about providing that accommodation and emotional support, transportation isn't within our mandate. Um, that said, there are some great programs like Hope Air and Fuel the Care that Irving uh, supports where we help direct people as well. Um, those are wonderful resources. Without a doubt, access to care from a transportation cost perspective and accommodation is a challenge. You know, somebody living in Surrey or Miramichi doesn't have the same access as those of us who live in HRM. And so how do you create that equal playing field. There is work to be done, uh, certainly on that front. Thank you. Ms. LeBlanc with about five minutes here. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I would imagine that on a daily basis, you you get all kinds of questions by you know from stressed out parents, uh, as uh, many of us do when we uh, have, are in our constituency offices, and we do our best to sort of navigate where we can, right, and point people in the direction where there is support. Um, uh, wondering about, uh, well, no, you just answered that, so never mind. Um, so uh, in terms of the um, capacity of the house, current and future, um, you said that, it, I just want to confirm this is, is, this is right, that three, there, last year there were 300 days where people were turned away, so there were 65 days where you didn't have to turn anyone away, is that correct? Yeah? Okay, um, yeah, and yes. again, so, oh, sorry. You want to get some other? confirm the witness uh, said yes. Uh, Ms. LeBlanc, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so, um, wondering, again, so you, you have options. You can connect them with social workers. You can connect with them with low-cost hotels and that kind of thing. So then in a general way, do you, aside from any of the things that we haven't, or that we have uh, spoken about already, would you say in your experience there are any other areas where there are significant gaps for supports for families who are coming for treatment at the IWK? Ms. Ward, please. I think healthy nutri nutritional options is is always uh, a paramount concern. I think um, when we look at our healthcare system and we look at um, the need to eat nutritiously and how that benefits us from a, a mental health perspective um, is very important. One of the things that we are very lucky um, in that we have a lot of volunteer as well as community um, and corporate support is through our home for dinner program. Um, so prior to the pandemic, on three nights of the week, uh, groups would come into the house to cook home cooked meals and those are fully accessible for families and they are absolutely zero cost. Uh, through the course of the pandemic we've realized that we can't bring in those individuals into the house um, but we are very lucky in that we have a, a great deal of commitment from our staff and volunteers where we've been able to pivot that home for dinner program into a takeaway meal program so we are currently uh, preparing and indiv individually packaging um, home cooked meals that can be taken away and picked up on a one hour basis three days a week directly inside the hospital at the IWK. Um, but certainly as we look towards consistency for the future is being able to provide not simply uh, a, a kitchen environment where they can prepare meals to create a degree of normalcy for their family to sit down and have a home-cooked meal together, um, but it's also to be able to provide those no-cost options for them as well. Thank you, Ms. LeBlanc. So in that case, so normally in, in, the, nor in the normal world, the families would have access to the kitchen, but they would bring in their own groceries and cook. Um, so that sounds like a great program, um, the, the home for dinner program. And, what, and same things for breakfast, they, they just bring in their own groceries and they keep them in their room or they keep them in the kitchen. How does it work? Ms. Ward. So prior to the pandemic, families would each have access to their own kitchen cupboard, their own space within the fridge where they could provide, they could purchase their own groceries. In addition to being able to bring their own groceries, there's also a full pantry that is stocked by RMHC of um, healthy options that families can use to make dinner for themselves or make breakfast for themselves. We also have some fantastic partnerships with the Egg Farmers of Nova Scotia, um, among many others. Saputo is another one that comes to mind um, that, that are able to 
to provide us with some of those staples. So milk, bread, cheese, butter, those are all completely free for families to use um, and to consume. In addition to that, they, we also have a breakfast to go program, which are also fresh, fresh fruit, um, you know, healthy snacks, uh, Nutri-Grain bars, things like that, that are completely free for families to use. And again, during the pandemic, we've been able to pivot that um, and five mornings a week inside the hospital, there's a takeaway snack program so they can drop in themselves or have one of their, uh, one of their uh, health workers drop into the family room and grab one of those to-go snacks that's completely contactless. With 15 seconds, Ms. LeBlanc. Um, I've really enjoyed asking these questions. Maybe we'll see you in the second round. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you, folks. We're going to move to the Liberal Caucus, beginning with Mr. Irving, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you uh, all for being here. Uh, you know, clearly, the uh, Ronald McDonald House is a very important part of our, our system, really, in, in working with, uh, with the IWK and, and providing services uh, to our critically ill children. Um, so thank you for all the work that you do. I wanted, uh, first of all, to ask you to maybe expand more on the emotional support aspect of your work. I don't think many Nova Scotians have a good sense of that and whether you could expand on that. Do you have professional counselors or volunteers? Are they trained? Or is it just a shoulder to cry on? Uh, what, what, what makes up the, the, the emotional supports that you provide? Ms. Barker, please. So you are correct in noting that we do not have trained professionals. It is not a formal program that you would receive. Um, it is more the informal type of emotional support that we are referencing. You're right, shoulder to cry on, someone to talk to. You know, we talk to families, and, and I've heard families speak of other families as mentors. You know, you have somebody who has a little one in the NICU who's four weeks ahead of you, and you come back from the hospital and you're overwhelmed and trying to process the information, and you have another family who is down the road, you know, four weeks ahead of you saying, you know what, you're exactly where you need to be. This is exactly what you can expect. And there's someone there to talk through those things with and that's that's the you know emotional piece that I refer to our staff our amazing listeners as well as are our volunteers so again more informal I don't want to misrepresent that as though to seem we are professional counselors that is not part of our service offering thank you mr. Irving please thank you for the shoulders um, uh, just going back to the 18 million dollar build um, and I don't think the presentation touched on the contributions to date so could you outline where we are with respect to federal provincial funding and and uh, private sector funding and, and the gap that needs to be filled over the coming months years whatever oh miss Barker please sorry what was formally submitted and funded was a $21 million um, total project. Uh, initially, we were looking at 18, so that might be where the number comes from. Um, we, of course, have the support of the federal government and the province of Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island. Hopefully, another announcement forthcoming that will bring public sector to support to the $11 million mark, which leaves a $10 million uh, gap that we are looking to the community to help step up and support. We are well on our way. Um, towards that, I would say about 70% or more um, towards the private sector goal. So again, we have some phenomenal volunteer leadership throughout the Maritimes based in all our key centres helping to mobilize community. Mr. Irving, please. And thank you. Um, and perhaps I'll, I'll offer this up as an opportunity for you to uh, share with Nova Scotians on ways to help your your uh, website talks about an Adopt-A-Room program, a Community Champions program, and donation and volunteering. I was wondering if you could maybe expand on that to uh, let us all know uh, uh, of how Nova Scotians and other Maritimers could uh, step up and help. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barker, please. Thank you for the question. Um, certainly volunteers, as we mentioned earlier, are the lifeline to our organization. Right now, it is a very difficult time to be volunteering with us. We have to be very mindful of those that are able to come into the spaces that we have just to protect the health and safety of our families. Um, but for those that are looking for other ways to help, yes, please do visit the website. Um, if you are reading the news and watching, the charitable sector has been um, very much impacted by the pandemic, obviously 
reflective of our economy and, and where individuals are finding themselves today. Um, so it has been a challenging time. And so that support, if those of, of you out there in the, in the province that are interested in helping, online donations would be tremendously helpful. And as we head into our holiday season, we also have a wish list. If there are those of you who prefer to give items, um, then we can make arrangements as to how those can be delivered safely um, to the house as well. Mr. Irving, please. And the adopt to rum program and community champions, do you want to expand on those? Ms. Barker, please. <laughs> I'm not very patient, am I? Um, the Adopt-A-Room program is a wonderful way for community partners to sponsor a room. In essence, their name goes on that space for the run of a year. And so we encourage those of you who are in a position uh, to join us. Those naming opportunities begin at the $5,000 mark. And the Community Champions Initiative really speaks to our third party fundraising. So community groups, service clubs, organizations, families who want to do something to support the cause. Um, we always encourage people to think about the overnight cost to the organization to sponsor a family, and that's $140 per person. So to be able to contribute that amount, you would know that you're helping with the cost of an overnight stay for uh, a family to be with us. So lots of different ways to get involved, but um, community fundraising is certainly one way. Thank you, Mr. Irving. Thank you. I'll turn it over to my colleague. Ms. Ms. Costanzo, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, it's, it's always lovely to, to, to hear about the Ronald McDonald's house. Uh, I, I thought I knew the Roland McDonald's house, but I've confused the Roland McDonald's house with the Roland McDonald family room because they could stay there. So to me, that was the house. So I'm actually listening to you and thinking, how did I not hear about the house? Uh, I worked with refugees and uh, the majority of them are, of course, in the city. They, they would not need to stay overnight, most of them. So I've had a couple of occasions where I've used the, um, the family room where I, I'll, come, I, I'll get to my assignment and either the nurse or your amazing social workers. I, I, if I really want to commend the, the, the two or three social workers that I've worked with at the IWK and how sensitive they are to um, different cultures and different people. So I would arrive and they say, we don't know, you know, the husband had gone to take the kids from school and the mother has been there for hours without food. And she would tell me, can you ask her to see if she's had anything to eat? Uh, and if not, maybe take her to the family, you know, McDonald, fa McDonald family, sorry. Um, it, it's, it's very emotional for me at times because I would take them upstairs and they're so strange to the food that there is. And there is peanut butter and the bread that we're used to. And they're not used to either. And I, I remember the first time I did it, I put it on and she just shook her head. No, she's not touching it. Uh, they're not used to what peanut butter. So I, I spent 10, 15 minutes explaining what peanut butter is and how, it, how we use it here. Um, so I'm wondering if there is anything between the, the volunteers that you have, um, if you can maybe um, have some of them who are you know, students from the university who are of these cultures of the new immigrants, so who would help them understand and maybe help you stock maybe pita bread and something else that they're able to eat. Uh, I, I really, it, she went hungry and then the second time I did a, a trick and sat her, the second lady, I sat her on the couch and I did the toast and I put one with peanut butter and one with peanut butter and jam and told her to close her eyes and taste them. And then she ate them and loved them. <laughs> so this is how I had to make them understand this is, you know, it was the best thing for my kids and how their kids would love it and introduce them to things that we eat here. But it's very difficult for the newcomers. They, uh, and they would go hungry before they ask for food or for money. So uh, that, that cultural difference is, is very important and maybe uh, having students who will understand, uh, you know, your volunteers or students who will understand so they can inform um, the people of, of using it. I don't think I've ever had anybody using the house overnight uh, or the other house that you just told me about and I'm so excited that you're, uh, you know, uh, making it larger. Do you have any statistics of how many um, multicultural or, or new immigrants who have used your services? Ms. Barker, please. 
That is a discussion we've been having. It is not data that we have been collecting to date. Um, we have traditionally been an organization that has been incredibly respectful of the privacy of families, um, but we are increasingly understanding the importance that for conversations such as this, uh, I think increasingly it is important for us to be able to capture that information in a way that's very respectful to families. Um, one of the things that we have established within our organization is a diversity and inclusion working group um, to look at how best we can support and ensure sure that we are providing that, that experience to a diverse range of individuals and families who are coming to us. And so we look forward to looking, you know, yes, without a doubt, food is one of those elements, signage, um, our welcome packages, and just how we're able to present the information in a language that they know. Uh, all of those elements are, some, are pieces of the diversity and inclusion that we're working towards. Um, and we would invite any of you who are interested in contributing to that conversation to please um, let us know if you're interested in, uh, in helping inform those discussions and also wanted to touch on you know you mentioned that you weren't aware of the house one of the things that we really are focused on is raising the awareness of the house and of the family room programs in general there is a lot of messaging out there as I'm sure you can appear so uh, can understand so making sure that we um, connect with those families and that everyone is aware that we are there to, to support them is crucial is critically important so if you have advice or insights on how we can be doing that um, differently please do let us know it is it is really important. It's one of the things as we go into this major campaign, as we publicly launch in the winter, we're really excited about the profile that will come with that so more families know that we're there as a resource. So I, I think we're just going to, excuse me, Ms. De Costanzo, I think we're going to take this opportunity to break for 15 minutes. We'll reconvene the committee at quarter after two. Please and thank you.
order, please. We're going to move back to Ms. Di Costanzo for nine minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so again, thank you for the information you provided regarding the um, newcomers and maybe a relationship with uh, ISINs will let you know who's coming and what languages and who uh, to invite as uh, a, a relationship. So, and also to, for us to promote it for you. Uh, what can we do as MLA, my colleagues and I, if you are trying to fundraise, if you have, it's a bit difficult with uh, COVID to have events and invite us and we can promote it for you as well. But maybe uh, if you have a poster of a fundraising event or information that you want to share, if you could send it to us and we will share it with all our constituents. And that way also people get to know about Ronald McDonald's house that we didn't know. So I'm, I'm wondering if you have any of these ideas right now. Ms. Barker, please. Thank you so much for the offer, and we would be incredibly grateful for any of that. So we can share some information, um, links to, to the website for sure. I know some of that information was circulated before the meeting. Um, with respect to the campaign itself, we'll be publicly launching in January. Uh, so we'd love to circle back to you then around the new house initiative in particular. And if all goes well, the hope is that we have a shovel in the ground next summer. So that will really depend on the level of community support we receive. So thank you for offering. Ms. D. Costanzo. We would be honored if we were invited to come and publicize it for you. And if you have small posters, I think that's the easiest thing for us, just a, with a lit, as little information uh, and uh, some, a link to where they can help or how they, they can donate. Uh, just little posters work very well on our social media. Thank you. That's it. That's it. Oh, Ms. Miller, please. And thank you so much for coming in. This is such an important an important thing for families in the Maritimes to be able to know that they have your support and that they have the support when they're at the worst, probably the worst times in their lives. I don't think there's anything harder than seeing your child struggle, let alone, you know, major medical uh, issues that, uh, that impact the whole family. But um, I have a few quick questions. Uh, the first is about your average night stay. I know you mentioned that seven nights was your average night stay. Is there a max? I understand there's not a max. You never tell people or ask people to leave, whatever. What is the longest stay that you've ever had? Miss Ward. I can provide that um, after, however, it is uh, in excess of one year that we did have a family staying with us. And it was a Nova Scotia family. Ms. Miller, please. Uh, we don't need a further update, but that, that's great. So how, uh, maybe you can walk me through this process because um, I'm wondering, you know, if a family, say, is coming from northern New Brunswick, you know, doesn't know what they're in for, you know, really until they get there and need a place to stay, need this, you know, how, can you walk me through that process of what they have to go through when they're coming down, the child is coming to the hospital, you know, you talked about social workers and whatever being referred. Can you walk me through that, what a family would have to go through? Thank you, Ms. Miller, Ms. Ward. Certainly, uh, thank you for the question. Um, no matter whether it's a pre-planned um, event that, that would bring them to the IWK or something that is traumatic and in the moment need, need immediate accommodations, um, the IWK social work team will typically contact us if it is uh, a family that is currently in crisis and needs accommodation uh, immediately. Um, for the Ronald McDonald House, we do have um, support 24-7 with our resident managers, so they can accommodate a, a family to check in at any time of the night, depending on what time the family may arrive and, and require accommodations. Uh, and simply with us, all that we require for families to do is to confirm they are in fact um, uh, have a pediatric patient under the age of 18 or up to the age of 21, so long as they're still classified as a dependent, and that they just receive a referral from a social worker to confirm that they are aware of what our space is and the fact that it is communal living, their shared communal spaces, and that they will work well in our environment. Thank you, Ms. Miller, with four minutes to go. I can do that. So um, 
I was interested to find here that, that they needed to supply some of their own food. I, w I wasn't aware of that at all. So that's really interesting. It really speaks to, you know, where that can be improved, I think, and, and looking at your policies and where your partnerships can be. Um, in the existing, uh, maybe just one more question, in the existing facility, how many staff do you have now that actually work for Ronald McDonald House now? I know you have a lot of volunteers besides, and how many, how will that change with the new building? Will the capacity in increase the staff or just increase the residents who are there? Ms. Barker, please. So we have 13 to 14 full-time staff we are recruiting right now. Um, and then we also have a number of part-time, how many? Six. Six. FSAs, yep. Family Service Associates, who uh, handle the evenings and weekends for us. So when we go to a 36-bedroom facility, we will indeed be increasing the staff complement in order to ensure that that quality of stay and, and access is there for the families who need support, have questions, um, make sure that we can handle the check-in process with that many more families coming through the front door. So right now, our operating budget is about $1.4 million. It was last year in 2019. And we're projecting with the house and the two family rooms that we will probably be around 2.2 million in the new house. So a large part of that is going to be just managing the facility. Right now our house is 11 or 12,000 square feet. Our new house will be 40,000 square feet. Um, so we certainly will have a higher bill around the maintenance of the facilities. Um, but we will be adding likely another three uh, to four staff that will be helping on the mission delivery side of, side of things. And just to speak to the size of the house, that's very much informed by um, the sizes across the country and the overall kind of square foot per bedroom ratio we should be working with to ensure we have enough space to accommodate these families comfortably, um, both through pro programming spaces, through the kitchen space, uh, as well as through the bedrooms. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That sounds really, uh, really exciting. I'm really pleased to see, and I too look forward to the day that that shovel goes in the ground and that work can start. And you know, I assume what less than a year for the build. Is that what your expectation is? Miss Barker, please. <laughs> I will get this by the end. Um, thank you for the question. I, it will not be 12 months. I, I wish it would be that quick. Um, our architects and construction uh, representatives are, are estimating it will be likely a 24-month build, 18 months at best. Thank you. Mr. Horn, please. Yes, thank you very much. It's been very enlightening to listening to your conversations today. And just to continue on, and do you do very rarely or always or can have uh, families from outside of Canada? It's Ms. Oh, Ms. Barker. Thank you. Uh, it doesn't happen often, um, but if a family were to find themselves in the Maritimes and needing to access care at the IWK Health Center, they would go through the referral process that Leanne spoke to, and we are there to help any of those families in need. Um, so it is on occasion that that has happened, yes. And just to speak to the food piece uh, as well, you can imagine the diversity in tastes and preferences that come with 18 families. And so we are always uh, doing our best to make sure that there are lots of options for the families. Um, but as you can appreciate, even when, you know, we go somewhere for, for a weekend or a night stay, we might have our own tastes. And so we just want to give families the option to have a space to bring in their own, um, whether it's snacks or their own um, meals. But we do very much try and provide that range. Yeah. Cool. So that's actually going to conclude this round of questioning. We'll move on to the second round, 12 minutes a pop. Uh, we'll begin with Mr. LeBlanc and the PC caucus. Please and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much so far for the informative uh, session and information that you brought forward to this committee. Um, you know, looking through the doc some of your online documents on, on your webpage, learned that 65% of Canadians live outside of a city. Um, with the children's hospital. So having a robust um, facility and organization like yours uh, speaks to the importance of, of the care that's being provided here in Nova Scotia for Atlantic Canadians. Um, I also understand that there's 15 houses across, um, Ronald McDonald houses across the country. So just wondering what is yours going to look like in comparison to the others across Canada? I'm sure there's things that go well at those facilities currently and, and things to improve on. So just wondering if you can provide a few remarks on that. 
Ms. Barker. Thank you. Uh, and just to speak to that statistic around the 65%, if you can believe it, in the Maritimes, we are a very rural region, and we here actually have closer to 78% of our families um, living outside of a, of a city with a children's hospital. So the demand for our services, you can appreciate, is even higher relative to other areas of the country. Um, as far as the spaces, we work very closely with our chapters across the country to learn about what works in their houses, what doesn't work, what improvements can be made, uh, and we certainly leverage the great best practices that are in place. So um, so much so that our architectural firm, we're working with uh, Leiden Lynch locally, but we're also doing so in partnership with a firm out of Toronto called Montgomery Sizem, who has built the house at, in Toronto and also a number of their family rooms. So we're able to really incorporate a lot of those um, great, as I said, best practices around the design of the kitchen and, and things like that. Um, what varies by region is the architecture design that you're looking at um, based on where you're building. The size of the land that you're working with so you can appreciate that all of those pieces lead to you know certainly some variances around what the houses look like from from one chapter to the next thank you mr leblanc please uh, thank you mr chair um i'm interested to know more about how you got to this point so you spoke earlier um this afternoon about accessibility features of of the current house, um, that it's it's dated, it's built only for pretty much one family. Um, so, um, how did you get to this point? Obviously, the um, I assume that the demands have grown. Um, but at what point did you say, hey, this we need we need to make some changes here, and, and we need to go to government? And I'm wondering how those discussions with government took place, and and how well received they were. Ms. Barker, please. Uh, so I've been on the team for about four years, um, but what I can share is that this has been a conversation, as you can appreciate, with any large undertakings like this, capital projects. Um, the vision for them comes up often a number of years before, so it's probably been about 10 years or so that the vision and the recognition that we needed to do more for maritime families um, was really born by the board uh, and the executive director at the time. And so there's been a lot of evolution in those conversations um, all along the way, talking with our partners in government, talking with our partners at the IWK Health Centre uh, to really inform what that space needed to look like and what we needed to do to create um, a space that would meet the needs of families today and well into the future. And so government has been part of those discussions in various iterations all along uh, at different levels of government as well. Mr. LeBlanc, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Wondering, I guess touching on touching based on a previous question I had asked is regarding the funding of the project. Um, as government is government going to require any like reporting on the progress of the project? Let's say there's any delays uh, with the project. If uh, like I, we we discussed previously, if costs surmount what what's being previously projected, um, and then maybe an avenue to go knocking on some other doors um, in the future. Ms. Parker. So reporting requirements are absolutely an element of what we need to look at, both with our provincial government as well as our government funding partners. Uh, in fact, our first report request has already come in around the government funding uh, with the Government of Canada. So that is, without a doubt, an important part of this process and an expectation around the receipt of funds for this project. Uh, it's also a best practice we implement around all of our donors, so any of our major supporters to the capital project will be receiving updates and will understand how their funds are being used towards uh, the overall build. As far as cost management, uh, as mentioned, we, we are doing what we can to ensure that we're managing costs, that we're um, making changes to the design to minimize any costs that we can. We, of course, don't want to do make any changes to the detriment of the experience that our families are going to have. Um, so we're trying to balance that. And if additional funds are, are required and we deem that to be necessary in order to not, not compromise the quality of a family stay, we would be looking to the private sector to help um, bridge that gap. And by private sector, I would mean community supporters and donors. Thank you, Ms. Barker. Mr. LeBlanc, please. Thank you very much. So can you speak a little bit to some of the details, high-level details of, of the data required in those reporting um, documents to various level governments? Ms. Barker. 
No, but I can share with you what they have requested from me. <laughs> um, they will be looking for accounting and invoices, obviously a true understanding of where the funds are being spent. Um, we are accountable uh, legally as a charity uh, with CRA to make sure that those funds are being used based on the donor's intention and government would be uh, considered a donor, a major investor in this project. So there's a number of different elements that they'll be speaking to, but certainly uh, proof of payment and cost of um, project fees uh, will be an element of that. Mr. LeBlanc with about six minutes to go. Thank you. I guess living in a world of COVID, uh, I'd like to dive in, into some of the challenges and barriers that uh, COVID has presented for your organization and, and for the house. So you, you closed the, the house and reopened it and then uh, set some limitations for, for volunteers. So just looking for a status update of where you guys are at present and then what you're, what you're hoping to achieve in the near future uh, based on the current epidemiology. Ms. Ward, please. I didn't think we would ever be in this position. I think when someone had originally talked about COVID-19 and um, you know, in us being financially and fiscally responsible and talking about what a house closure would look like, I was the first one to say, that's never going to happen. Um, and here we find ourselves, what, eight, nine months later. Um, we unfortunately did have to close our house and spent um, two very long months and very tireless days um, in preparing for what, uh, and what our inevitable reopen would look like and how we could do that safely for um, the most critical of families. Um, initially, when we reopened the house, um, we had a significant number of different COVID-19 protocols, all of which we have maintained but we have gone through a very strategic and very slow reintegration process to ensure that we are constantly monitoring what those daily exposures look like, not just simply in the HRM, but all across the maritime provinces, and that we're screening our, our families accordingly. Um, in addition to that, we are also doing daily wellness checks with each of our staff, our volunteers, and any of our mandatory visitors to the house, that being um, maintenance volunteers, um, maintenance contractors, things like that. Um, with our families, we want to ensure that they feel as safe as possible and that they understand the seriousness that we have taken this pandemic and how we're applying the lessons learned from Premier McNeil and Dr. Strang and how we're constantly evolving to ensure that we are on a day-to-day -day basis keeping our families, our staff and our volunteers as safe and as healthy as possible. Right now, we are at nine families. Um, when we originally reopened, we started with five and we were doing family bubbles, um, only doing an admittance window of three days and then locking down for a period of 14. As we have seen our numbers dwindle here in, in, in the maritime provinces and how successful our bubble has been, um, not looking at the recent <laughs> at the recent exposure list, um, but and really managing that day to day and evolving those numbers as safely as possible with our IWK partners as well, guiding us along the way. Uh, Mr. Campbell, please. Thank you. I, I just want to commend um, the the team at RMHC for the robust uh, reopening plan that was put forward and developed. Um, that was presented to the board and required board approval prior to commencement and also acknowledged that uh, the team has worked with RMHC Canada uh, in the development of that plan um, and, and speaks to their commitment uh, and drive to uh, be able to offer service offerings um, to the families of the Maritime Provinces. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Just shy of three minutes, uh, Mr. LeBlanc, please. Thank you very much. I guess so to tie in with uh, the financial burden that we spoke about uh, previously for charitable organizations, I understand that yeah, there's a close relationship between the McDonald's restaurants and, and your, the, ch the charitable organization. Um, so I know in my constituency uh, and in the, my region that um, the owners of the, that, those restaurants um, you know, proudly support the initiatives uh, to fundraise for your organization. So uh, can you uh, explain a little bit uh, of that relationship and, and how it certainly benefits uh, your organization in the House? Ms. Barker. 
Thank you for that. It, it's wonderful to have an opportunity to speak to that partnership, actually. I think there's a, quite a misunderstanding at times around the partnership where some people think that we're fully funded by or a foundation of McDonald's, and, and that isn't the case. Um, that said, they are our founding and forever partners. So without a doubt, we have an incredible partnership. I've never seen anything like it, uh, actually, with corporate partnerships in the charitable sector. They are engaged financially. They are engaged with their crews uh, at all levels of volunteerism, right up to RMHC Canada. Um, last year, they would have contributed, I believe it was about 45% of our annual operating came through different initiatives with our McDonald's partners. And relative to the other chapters in the country, we're extremely proud that that percentage is actually the highest here in this region. Uh, the norm that you see across the country is about 30%. Um, so they are incredibly engaged here, not just in their ongoing in restaurant programs like their Happy Meal program and different things, but they come out and support all of our different events and initiatives. Um, very actively. Mr. LeBlanc. How much time left, Mr. Chair? One minute. Uh, I'm just going to wrap things up uh, by thanking you all very much for uh, for attending today's health committee. It's very much appreciated to learn more about um, the future of your organization and the future of the home of your house and, and its benefit for all uh, all of our region. Uh, and I guess I'll I'll open up the floor. Uh, Miss Ward previously spoke about uh, personal experiences about opportunities of the first of you know first time reading, first time walking, and if there's any other opportunities that you'd like to share with us uh, about that. Ms. Ward. How long do I have? Because I could probably do this for a week seconds. straight. 30 seconds, go. <laughs> um, I'll talk about one special Cape Breton family. Um, and it really does drive home the feeling of privilege that our staff and volunteers, and, and that privilege is, is that we get to experience um, all of the firsts. Um, we had a Cape Breton family who came through um, when she was a high-risk pregnancy um, with her first pregnancy and as she's coming through now and that pregnancy is now a two-year-old very cute little boy and she's experiencing another high-risk pregnancy as we're walking through the house she can tell you the exact place where her water broke. She can tell you um, the mom that was sitting at the dining room table who was sending off her well wishes as she was getting her hospital bag scared out of her mind to head to the hospital and just being assured and having a bit of a, celebra a celebratory party as she was walking you know, out the door to, to make that very short seven minute walk to the hospital. Um, and now we get to experience um, her two year old son and how their family unit and dynamic is growing. Uh, and uh, we are reminded of that privilege on a daily basis. Very cool. All right, uh, thank you Mr. LeBlanc, Ms. LeBlanc for 12 minutes, please, thank you. Thank you. I might just give up my time just to hear other stories about about uh, pregnant moms, but um, I just love those stories. <laughs> um, no, I have a couple more questions. Um, so, for families who with children who have complex medical needs, um, obviously we've talked a little bit about this already, but accommodation uh, might be one of a host of expenses that they are experiencing. Um, you know, obviously uh, expensive medications or medical devices that might not be covered by family pharmacare or a private drug plan, uh, or aren't covered because families don't have access to a, a private drug plan. So I'm wondering if you know or if you can speak to what proportion of families uh, that use your services have private drug coverage? Ms. Barker. Sorry. That is not data that we collect, uh, so we would just defer to the regional uh, statistics around that. Ms. LeBlanc. Um, and can you speak to um, any sort of even anecdotal um, sort of uh, knowledge around what kind of expenses folks uh, incur that aren't covered, like, you know, I don't know, insulin needles and things like that that wouldn't be covered by drug plans that, you, that you've heard folks talking about that provide challenges or, or create challenges for them? Ms. Barker. We've spoken about transportation costs certainly being part of it, accommodation part, uh, costs, meals, medications. And there are a number of medications that are still not on the provincial formulary, and so we see that be a burden for um, families that are dealing with certain types of illness. Um, so anecdotally, we are certainly familiar um, with those kinds of costs. Sometimes it's not just about the cost, though. It's about lost income. So for those families who are no longer able to be working because you know one or both parents need to 
to be in the city to support their child and support one another through that journey. Um, so it's not just cost, it's lost income in that respect. And also childcare. Um, so for families that are traveling, they might not always have their other children with them. And so, you know, if they don't have community supports, that can also be another source of financial stress. Thank you, Ms. LeBlanc. Great. Well, this is a good segue into the, my my um, next question, which is, you know, undoubtedly these families um, who were under all of the stress, um, they they are facing, you know, immense anxiety, perhaps depression, um, certainly fear. Um, do families have easy access to mental health supports at the hospital? Uh, and I, you, you've spoken several times about the social workers, but um, do they have access to sort of specific mental health support? Ms. Barker, please. Uh, again, that is not a service that we provide specifically, so that's not a conversation that we're having with our families outside of referring them back to their support system, their social worker, uh, and team at the IWK Health Centre. Thank you. Ms. LeBlanc. Thanks. And is that something that... Um, you would ever look at providing, like having in-house counselors if, you know, um, there was a great big giant donation that <laughs> landed in your lap to be able to support that? Ms. Barker. It isn't something that we do at Ronald McDonald House Charities at this time. That's not to say that there wouldn't be an openness to exploring those types of partnerships, um, but in Canada right now, that isn't, uh, that isn't part of the mission delivery. Ms. LeBlanc. Thanks, and then I just want to ask a little bit about your your budget. So, um, you know, you said that your operating budget is about 1.4 million right now, and it will go up to 2.2 million. Um, and so, and the so the 45 percent is sort of your partnership with the McDonald's restaurant owners. I don't know what if they have like a. a official group, you know, that they're part of that, that give that money. But can you speak to other, uh, other sources of revenue? So, cause certainly if it's $150 a night to have a family there, $160 uh, and $11 is what they're charged, then like, where is all that money coming from? Ms. Barker. Very fortunate for many community partners. Um, and just to clarify, where McDonald's support comes in isn't based on a formula. So as we go to 2.2 million, their support won't be automatically at 45%. Um, it will adjust accordingly. So even more reason uh, and, and more priority, I guess, around engaging community partners around the work that we're doing. So, you know, we do have, as many charities do, we have a, a couple of fundraisers. We have a great golf classic that happens annually. We have an event called the PJ Walk for Kids that happens through the Maritimes and now virtually thanks to COVID um, we've been able to be really creative in how we encourage families to participate in that we have a number of corporate partners adopt a room is one of those initiatives we talked about earlier many third-party fundraisers and then a lot of just direct response opportunities where individuals and organizations are contrib contributing through online appeals or direct appeals that come through mail um, you know that said we do have some work to do to get to the level where we are we are going to be at the 2.2 million dollar mark our revenues last year were around 1.6 million to our annual fund. Um, so we do, you know, we have been growing that revenue, so we're at a place to sustainably support the new house. Ms. LeBlanc. And so it is largely then literally like individual donations, They're corporate donations or individual gifts. Yes. Ms. Barker. <laughs> We'll get this. Um, we don't receive any government funding for ongoing operational support at this time, so it is purely private sector support. Ms. LeBlanc. And do you apply for government funding, or ha uh, is, that, is that a conversation that you're trying to have or have had, or is that sort of like a philosophical decision of the organization? Ms. Barker. No, I wouldn't say it's a philosophical uh, conversation. Um, I think that we're seeing governments invest more so in capital type projects or one time extraordinary projects that the charitable sector is undertaking. And I think that there's a reticence um, around providing ongoing operational support um, to the charitable sector. Ms. LeBlanc with six minutes. Huh? Six minutes. Um, uh, you, you'll take the time. <laughs> um, I'm going to just refer to my little list here. Um, I guess I also wanted to know about um, the renovation or the, the new build in terms of that budget. Um, so you mentioned that it is, sorry, uh, what is the, the full budget of that project? 
Miss Barker? 21 million. Miss LeBlanc. And how much do you have left to raise? Seven? Miss Barker. Uh, we are north of 18 million now. Miss LeBlanc. Um, thanks. And so that, that remainder is, is community support. You're not going, and, and does that include um, uh, corporate donations or is that like literally individuals writing checks? That's part A. Part B is, um, can you talk about some of, like, have you announced, I'm sure you have, besides pro the government funding, have you announced your big partners and can you talk a little bit about that? Ms. Barker. So the $18 million certainly reflects both public and private sector. Um, no, we have not launched publicly, so we haven't been announcing any of the corporate or individual donations as of yet. That will come as soon as we launch the project um, in the winter. Ms. LeBlanc. Mr. Chair, I don't have any more questions. Do you have okay. any more questions? Okay. Okay, we'll, we'll move on to the Liberal Caucus and then if there's any time Afterwards, we'll, we'll go from there. So we've got Mr. Horn for 12 minutes, please. Again, I'd just like to, uh, again, the more you talk, the more information we're getting about Ronald McDonald House. It's quite impressive. Uh, you have said that the new building, it's cost $21 million, uh, is going to have a lot of upgrades, I'm sure. And maybe you could discuss some of the upgrades over and above what the older building has have had for you. Ms. Barker. Uh, yes, so the $21 million, just to clarify, includes soft costs as well. So there's cost of construction, there's also professional fees, uh, architectural fees, engineering, um, all of that adds up quite a bit, as well as, you know, your taxes and your financing and your fixtures, furnishing and equipment. So it, it doesn't take long, unfortunately, to get, to get to that amount, but it is including both hard and soft costs. Just wanted to clarify um, that piece. As far as the experience, um, we will have a vastly larger kitchen area. We're calling at the kitchen pavilion where you know our home for dinner groups can come in and still have space lots of space for the families to be preparing their own meals um, we're going to have much more um, family-centered kid-centered space play areas in the house for kids to be able to to enjoy that's an important element of making sure that when they're away from their hospital they're really enjoying an, a nice quality of life we'll have a grassy courtyard in the middle of the house where you know families can just sit and be where they can enjoy fresh air and and play on some uh, some equipment um, we're going to have more programming spaces where you know right now our dining room doubles as our board game table doubles as our arts and crafts room doubles as our yoga studio you know <laughs> and so now we're going to be able to have space where those programs are better contained where families that are dining can do just that where we'll have an arts and crafts area where the kids can really just cover themselves in glitter and stay in stay in that arts and crafts room um, so much more um, space for the families to also be able to choose. You know, Leanne mentioned it's all about choice. Families will be able to congregate in a larger living room together if they want, or they can choose to have their own space and sit in quiet. Uh, we will have a quiet, uh, small, quiet, kind of reflective room. And the bedrooms are the things that are going to change most drastically as far as the quality of experience. So right now, we have two beds in a room and a sink. There's no space for tables and chairs and everything else. And so in the new space, we'll actually have tables and chairs will have a washroom that is located in the room, much as you would see in a hotel um, space where the families can really comfortably, um, you know, stay together, spend quiet time, or again, come out and mix with the other families. So those are some of the highlights of what the new space, fully accessible. Uh, we will have two elevators, uh, so that's a, a major change. We have one old elevator that gets you most of the time from the lower level to the main level, um, and much closer proximity to the hospital. So I don't think I mentioned actually, we are right across the street from the emergency entrance of the IWK Health Center, so that will be huge. Mr. Campbell, please. Uh, thank you for the question and, and Laurie for that great description. I'll just also add there are two full apartment suites that are being incorporated, four, one on each level. Uh, so full apartment suites um, incorporated in the design. So that will be a, an, an upgrade, so to speak, um, from what's currently available as well as a fitness room for families uh, to be able to use during their stay. So many more amenities that um, will be offered that will support the well-being of families during difficult times. 
And actually back to Ms. Barker again. Sorry, just to add on that, the apartment style suites are so critically important because I mentioned that there is a significant population we cannot support right now, and those are children with compromised immune systems. Those apartment style suites, one on each of the four floors, will allow those families to safely isolate, not medically isolate, but safely isolate. They'll have their own kitchenettes and be able to, to spend time away from the hospital very comfortably. Thank you. Mr. Horn, please. Um, what is going to happen to the older facility? Is it going to be torn down or are you going to maybe turn it into something else? Ms. Barker. Um, so that space, that lot will be sold. Um, what the future owner chooses to do will, with, the, with the actual building is beyond my knowledge, uh, and we, we don't know who will be purchasing it. It is not up for sale at this time. Um, the nice thing about building this new space is we don't have a, a tight, tight deadline that we need to meet because we're going to be out of that building. Um, we do fully own it at, at this stage, so it will be sold when we move into the new space. Mr. Horn. When is the expected move-in, the new place? Ms. Barker. So at best, um, we do hope to put a shovel in the ground next summer. I think realistically the construction period will likely be 24 months. Um, now depending on, you know, available trades and materials, that could be longer. Um, but the goal would be to be within the house in, um, in two years from that point. Mr. Horn, please. Uh, just to go back to a question you may have answered in many different ways is what is the typical family that goes to the hospital or IWK and want to stay at the Ronald McDonald House. Uh, is there such a thing as a typical family or is it all over the, <laughs> the map? <laughs> Ms. Ward, please. It's as typical as the demographic of Nova Scotians. Um, I think that there is no typical family, whether it be a single parent, single income that's had to give up their income in order to be present with their child seeking medical attention, to um, a, a, new, a, a new, new Canadian family that has um, maybe one child or multiple children that are all requiring care. Um, one of the things that the IWK is a personal experience that I've witnessed is that when there are multiple children in the same family that are all requiring different specialized care, um, that those are all being coordinated as, as well as can possibly be coordinated so that it is reducing the frequency of trips that those families coming from a great distance um, have to make. I do just want to make one note in that we love our facility now and we are going to continue to love it until the day that we move to our new house. Um, we are very excited and very passionate about helping more families and delivering our mission in an even greater way, um, but we are going to love this house until it can no longer be loved. We also want to respect that since 1982, this house has meant a lot to the families that have stayed with us and, and we want to respect that um, and that we want to continue on that tradition and those traditions we've created at our current house and really have that smooth transition to our new house. We may lose a little bit of the Victorian character of our 110 year old home, um, but we are definitely going to be transitioning that into our new modern facility that can assist more people in a better way, but is still going to give them that feeling of comfort and home. Thank you. Mr. Horn. Do you offer any medical uh, assistance at all within the, the uh, lodging that you have? Ms. Ward. Not presently, no, and certainly that's not within the mission delivery. We want to make sure that what we do, we do very well, and that we allow the, the phenomenal facility of the IWK to be the experts in that area. Thank you. Mr. Horn, please. I'm fine. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Ms. Miller, please. And thank you again. Happy for this chance to ask you a few more questions. So um, I'm ending my political career soon, so I'm sort of reflecting at this point of what are the things that I'm most proud of, what are the things that you know we've accomplished, but then there's always things that you haven't done that would have been on a wish list that you wish you could have gotten done. So if you were to look at that now, what would be the things that you would say that you're the most proud of? You know, what has, what has happened, what initiatives have happened that you're most proud of? And if you had the druthers, what would be on your wish list for the future? Uh, Ms. Barker, please. Leanne might well want to follow up on this. You know, I think 
Our mission is all about keeping families close. Our mission is all about what happens on a daily basis and the role that we play to help alleviate some of the burden and stress that these amazing families are facing when they're dealing with, as you mentioned earlier, um, some of the scariest, most overwhelming um, stages in their lives. And so I think that, you know, those are the moments. Every one of those days, every one of those nights that our families stay with us are the moments that we hold on to and that we're most proud of. Um, within those days, there are all sorts of other moments. As Leanne said, you know, there's the firsts, there's the, you know, coming back after ringing the bell. Um, you know, there's, there's all of those special moments that are, that are cherished in this space. And really, when we look at moving forward and how we want to kind of leave our, leave our mark as an organization, it's just to make more of those days possible. You know, and that's what this new house is all about. It's making sure that we are not going to have to turn away families and that we can support them in the best way, uh, the best way that we can. Ms. Ward, please. One of the things that we take great pride in is trying to create a really fun experience, both for the patient as well as for the siblings. Um, when oftentimes they can be dealing with quite painful treatments um, and operations where there's going to be a long and intense recovery, having um, patients and siblings be excited about the trip to, the, to Halifax, to, to the IWK, and lessening some of the, the focus and attention that may be on the fear associated with what uh, um, what traumatic event they may be going through in creating that level of excitement is something that we try very, very hard to do. Um, our facility is all about kids being kids um, and kids remaining with their support system and then trying to create those really fun memories and opportunities. So it's things that they can look back on that they really enjoyed. They don't necessarily focus on um, the pain of the treatment, but more the opportunity that they got to learn a new recipe with one of our volunteers. So it's trying to shift some of that focus sometimes and, and allow kids to be kids. Ms. Miller, please. Yeah, and my final, final question, you had mentioned about the lady who was like seven minute walk to the hospital, you know, when she was in labor. How is that going to work with the new building? How far away is that? Ms. Ward. One of the things that we have uh, been very excited about is the location and the fact that we will be a crosswalk away from the hospital. Um, even though now we are only a seven minute walk um, and that we are in such close proximity, just being that much closer will mean the world of difference to the safety and security that people feel in just crossing the street versus having to come down a block and a half. Um, in addition to that, we are very hopeful that our facility being across the street and within eyesight of some of the children that may have a window that overlooks our facility, that they'll be really excited and wondering kind of what's happening across the street and something that really is uh, very child friendly. Cool. Uh, Ms. De Costanzo for a minute and a half. I just have a comment. I'm listening to you and I said they've picked the best people to run this house. Honestly, you both are so passionate, so loving, and uh, I'm sure all the staff, you, you exude this um, sense of um, duty and love for these families, and I'm sure that's the, f the feeling of that house. So thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you. Ms. Ward? If I could just make one comment, and this really does drive home how dedicated and committed our owner operators are. Um, my road to Ronald McDonald House started when I was 15 years old, and that was because I was hired as a part-time cashier at the, at the McDonald's in Woodstock, New Brunswick. And the stewardship and phil philanthropic attitude of those owner operators in the face of tremendous hardship, and I get emotional speaking about this because of how much passion they instilled in their part-time cashiers yeah. for me is a full circle moment in the privilege that I get to work at, at RMHC Atlantic. Ms. Barker. <laughs> It's almost like a reunion tour here. Um, my first role was actually in the Valley working at a McDonald's as well. Uh, it's not a pre, uh, it's not a qualification to apply to work at the team, um, but it, it certainly speaks to, you know, the love that our community has for this charity and, and what has been instilled uh, in so many people that have walked through those doors in the past. So again, just thank you so much for the time to be here and for your, for your questions and your kind comments. We'll jump back to Ms. Adams for about a minute and a half if she got one more. 
Thank you. It's actually not a question. I just want to take the opportunity to promote the wish list again um, for Ronald McDonald House. And I'm going to give the website. It's rmhcatlantic.ca. And the high priority items are grab and go snacks, Lysol wipes, hand sanitizers, and Ziploc bars. Uh, I think they should be bags, but it's, anyway. Um, other items are sponsoring a meal, providing supplies for meal gift cards. So I'm going to challenge all of the, the uh, nonprofit organizations out there and all of the businesses in Nova Scotia to step up and to consider uh, donating something on the wish list. And um, I just want to take this opportunity again to thank all of you and all of the volunteers um, and everyone who is supporting you for what you're doing um, because um, at a time when our children are ill is the time when they need the most support. So thank you all very much for all that you do. Thank you, committee members here. Uh, we'll invite our guests to make some closing remarks if they'd like. <laughs> uh, Ms. Barker. Uh, again, just wanted to, to thank you, to thank the community as a whole who's helping to bring this vision to life, um, to thank all of our supporters, our volunteers, our donors, the leadership of our, of our board who helped to make sure that our space is open and kept safe for the families who are staying with us, especially during this pandemic. Um, we look forward to sharing the excitement of our plans for this new house and uh, the transformational impact it's going to have. So thank you all for that. Uh, Mr. Campbell, please. Just on behalf of the Board of Directors, thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak with you today uh, for your um, considerate questions and for your support and uh, acknowledgement that uh, um, the message can be shared uh, broadly throughout our community. So thank you for all that you do uh, in support of Nova Scotians and for the show of support uh, to Ronald McDonald House uh, Atlantic. And again, just to acknowledge on behalf of the board, uh, the team and everything that they do, I believe it's been a strong demonstration of their commitment and passion uh, toward the families of this province and beyond. So uh, my acknowledgement and deepest respect uh, to Lori and her team. Thank you again. And on behalf of the Standing Committee on Health, thank you all for your time and effort. So we have a little bit of committee business. We're gonna recess for one minute uh, to give our witnesses time to exit the room to the back and then we'll get started again. Thank you. Okay, order please, we're gonna reconvene here and it, I'm gonna take the liberty of jumping to uh, request a motion for uh, accepting the 2020 annual report to be tabled in the House of Assembly. Uh, the clerk emailed members the draft on October 30th. Uh, 
requested any edits. No one suggested any. So do I have a motion? Uh, Ms. Adams? I make a motion that we accept the annual report as written and submitted. All those in favor? Contrary-minded? Motion carried. Uh, to our next uh, order of business, Mr. LeBlanc, would you like to re- uh, remind the committee members of your meeting, uh, or excuse me, your motion uh, for the record. Mr. Le Mr. LeBlanc. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, due to expiration of time at last health committee meeting, I had a motion on the floor that we weren't able to, uh, to deal and entertain. So I'll read it again for the, for the benefit of the House. And it's as follows, I quote, I'd like to make a motion that we write to the new Minister of Health and Wellness to extend virtual care services while at the same time forming a virtual care task force as has been done at a national level. This would be to ensure that all stakeholders that need to be at the table can be consulted to ensure that virtual care is appropriately rolled out effectively to not only benefit all of our population but also have the positive impact on our doctors as well." End quote. Uh, if I may, Mr. Chair, um, I'd like to add a couple comments to that. Uh, the last meeting we heard from doctors in Nova Scotia who overwhelmingly uh, expressed their approval and satisfaction, and, and so have Nova Scotians, and that uh, statistics greater than 95% who have uh, had uh, complete or part satisfaction with virtual care. Here we are uh, a month after um, the last health committee. We haven't heard any update. We're 51 days before the end of the calendar year. And may I add, we have to reconvene the legislature at some point. So, um, and still there hasn't been any progress uh, uh, advised uh, on this matter for Nova Scotians. So uh, I know that uh, myself and, and my colleague from uh, the Progressive Conservative Caucus will be supporting this motion. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. Is there any discussion? Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, I, uh, we support this motion. I just wanted to uh, make two extra comments. Uh, number one is that, you know, yes, we uh, were 51 days from the end of the calendar year, um, but we're also possibly moving into a second wave of the pandemic. And um, we have the most cases we've had in months uh, in Nova Scotia of COVID-19. And so uh, time is of the essence, in my opinion. I'd also like to flag an issue that was brought to my attention uh, by a, a physician and community member in Dartmouth about virtual care. And that is that um, virtual care is actually not available to people who use a walk-in clinic. And so uh, this is very concerning because as you know, there are many people in Nova Scotia who still don't have access to a family physician and need to use walk-in clinics but can't do virtual care at those clinics. So in terms of this um, uh, issue, uh, it's especially important that we make sure the minister is aware of that and the minister is working on that, that particular issue around virtual care. Uh, and uh, so I'll leave it there, but yes, we, I will be supporting the motion. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Adams, please. Thank you, and I just want to remind everyone that one of the reasons why we're bringing these motions forward at Health Committee instead of in the Legislature is that we're not sitting in the Legislature, otherwise we would have directly asked the Minister of Health. So one of the things that we're aware of is that um, the physicians from uh, across the province and Doctors Nova Scotia have indicated very clearly that they book patients months down the road. And at the present time, the uh, extension for virtual care by the current government is only until the end of this calendar year. We've only got a month and a half left. Um, so these physicians need to know what's happening. So um, we encourage the government to accept this motion and we are calling for a recorded vote. Is there any further discussion? Mr. Irving, please. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I looked at the national uh, report that was referred to in the motion. Um, that was actually a report uh, led by physicians. It was completely independent by, by government, and its purpose was to develop some national best practices to be shared across the pro uh, country uh, for uh, physicians and how they use virtual care uh, in their uh, offices. Um, so the, the idea that we would do this at a provincial level seems somewhat repetitive and, and would be certainly be something that Doctors Nova Scotia may want to do to help uh, advise and do professional development with, with doctors. Uh, with respect to the other elements in the motion, uh, 
extended. Uh, the virtual care has been extended, uh, and uh, and the Department of Health and Minister are working with Doctors Nova Scotia on future long-term arrangements. So the idea of creating a tax force uh, seems rather mute. So we will not be supporting this motion. Ms. Adams, please. Thank you. Of course, I'm very disappointed to hear that because we only have a month and a half left and physicians book patients three to six months down the road, but they can't do that because they don't know whether they have virtual care as an option to book people. So it's causing a lot of confusion. The other point I want to make is, if I'm recalling correctly from reading the report cover to cover, is that the report recommends provincial task forces and Doctors Nova Scotia indicated support for that. And frankly, I'm going to trust Doctors Nova Scotia to know what they need best for Nova Scotians. So uh, again, um, we're going to call for a recorded vote because we want to clear um, that we are in favour of the task force as well as extending virtual health care for all Nova Scotians. Um, and we want everyone to be aware of that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Okay, so there's been a call for a recorded vote. We will begin on my near left with uh, Ms. LeBlanc. Yes. Ms. Adams. Yes. Mr. Irving. No. Ms. Miller. No. Mr. Horn. No. Ms. DiCostanzo. Mr. LeBlanc. We. Oui. Ms. Coombs? Yes. And the chair votes no. Motion defeated. Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to first uh, ask for an extension of time for this meeting, uh, perhaps an extra um, 15 minutes, uh, because I would like to put forward a motion. So there's been a call for an extension of the meeting by 15 minutes, putting us at 3.30. Do we have any agreement on that? Agreed. I'm hearing agreed. Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you. Um, so I'm raising this issue and this motion as health spokesperson for the NDP caucus to recognize the critical health system impacts of our paramedic services. Paramedics put themselves and their families in harm's way to take care of Nova Scotians during the first wave of COVID-19, and they will do so again should we experience a second wave of the virus. But paramedics are still grappling with the same issues from before COVID-19 uh, arrived, and some have intensified. Paramedics are still working short and working extremely long shifts without breaks, being worn down, burnt out, and sometimes being assaulted at work. They now have to contend with the risk of bringing COVID-19 home to their families. These issues have an impact on the healthcare system as a whole. It's critical to understand what gaps exist in our emergency health services and how to address them. To this end, the Auditor General has asked the Department of Health and Wellness uh, to conduct a review of Nova Scotia's emergency health services, which resulted in a report by Fitch & Associates at a cost of $144,000. But the department has refused to release the report to the public. Nova Scotians deserve to know what improvements are recommended in the report. So Mr. Chair, I move that the committee write a letter to the Minister of Health and Wellness calling on him to immediately provide the Fitch & Associates report to the members of the Health Committee. Thank you, Ms. LeBlanc. Uh, discussion, uh, Mr. LeBlanc. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'd like to thank my honourable colleague, Ms. LeBlanc, for bringing forward this motion to the Health Committee. Uh, it, it's certainly uh, an issue that, uh, that, that uh, speaks close to home for me due to my previous professional background. Um, Ms. LeBlanc is very, very um, correct in saying that the issues that currently exist uh, have existed prior to COVID um, and this challenge is within the system, uh, such as you know, the missed lunches and missed prolonged uh, shifts and, and the assaults uh, on paramedics. But there are also the impact on the, the delivery of care for Nova Scotians, such as missed transfers and surgeries and appointments. Um, and it, which is effectively resulting in prolonged and delayed response times when you call 911 and you're expecting paramedics to arrive at your door in due time. Um, this is happening right across our province, including in my constituency of Argyle Barrington. I know myself and, and many members of my uh, caucus have been sound the alarm on this, and I appreciate the paramedic union, uh, their efforts for sound the alarm with their code critical campaign. 
Um, it, it's, it's shameful that the current government and it continues to be so secretive um, and failing to address um, this concern. Um, I, in fact, wrote to the Auditor General last month, I believe it was, uh, which was part of my exhaustive uh, measures um, to bring to light the issues within the system and to continue to call on the government to, to address um, the many, many challenges that exist within uh, the pre-hospital emergency care system. Every day, Mr. Chair, uh, the health, uh, safety, and lives of Nova Scotians are put at jeopardy um, because of uh, this government failing to address the challenges and, and their disconnect with the, the uh, important care and services that paramedics provide to Nova Scotians each and every day. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Thank you. I also want to thank our colleague from the NDP caucus for bringing this forward. I spent two hours at a constituent's home the other night with three paramedics who were waiting for um, to transport somebody to the hospital. And I had an opportunity to speak to them and they are burnt out and exhausted. And after they were going to be done the call, taking this person to the hospital where they expected to be sitting with them for at least six to eight hours to offload, they then had a two hour drive because they were from down in the valley coming to Eastern Passage. So it is unconscionable that we paid for a report, the public paid for a report for $144,000, but don't have any right to see what those recommendations are. And if at any point in our history we needed the best evidence possible to make changes to our healthcare system, it is right now. So I'm calling on the government to um, approve this uh, motion. And again, um, don't want to be presumptive, but I'd like for us to have a recorded vote on this as well. Further discussion? Hearing none, there's been a call for a recorded vote. We'll begin again with Ms. LeBlanc. Yes. Ms. Adams. Yes. Mr. Irving. No. Ms. Miller. No. Mr. Horn. No. Ms. De Costanzo. No. Mr. LeBlanc. We. Oui. Ms. Coombs, excuse me. Yes. Uh, chair votes no. Motion is defeated. Uh, Ms. Adams, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have three motions to put forward, so I would like to ask for an extension of the time in order to bring these three forward. And if anybody is frustrated, which I just heard a bunch of sighs and head shaking, um, perhaps we could reconvene the legislature, which is where we would have preferred to be asking these questions. So I hope you'll indulge us because since we've only sat for 13 days this year, um, this is the only opportunity government has given us to ask some questions. So I'm going to make a motion that we extend the time another 15 minutes until we can get through these three remaining motions. So there has been a request there's been a motion made to extend the time an additional 15 minutes. Is there any discussion on that motion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. 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 Motion is defeated. Is there any further business? Ms. Adams, please. Well, I'm going to start with the motions, and I, I have to tell you, in all of my time in public office, uh, members of the government voting down my opportunity to bring forward the, the voice of my constituents um, because they don't want to hear what they have to say, I have to say, tell you I'm shaking with anger right now because we've got an upsurge in numbers of cases in this province and community spread and this government doesn't want to give us an extra 15 minutes. I'm going to move on to the net first motion and see what we can get uh, done. <sighs> Number one, the preamble I'll keep short. We had an incident last week where the public health put out a warning about potential community exposure all over HRM, especially in Halifax. Initially, when people called 811, they were told they weren't to get tested because they didn't have any symptoms. Turned out public health made an error and they got uh, a new um, uh, motion sent out to the public telling them to call back. So right now in this province, we do not allow for testing of people who do not have symptoms. 
So the PC caucus is putting forward a motion for this health committee to write to the Department of Health and Wellness to expand COVID-19 testing capacity to include those in Nova Scotia with no symptoms who may have experienced community uh, contact. And I would like to have a recorded vote. Thank you. Is there any discussion on the motion? Mr. Irving, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I believe that uh, uh, we need to leave the decisions around testing to the experts at public health. They are the ones that are evaluating the risks and the resources that we have. And uh, uh, I think it would be best place to trust public health to make those decisions on behalf of Nova Scotians. They have done a, a remarkable job to date, and uh, I think this is no time to walk away from the trust that we've given them to make the best decisions for Nova Scotians. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Irving. Any further discussion on that motion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. There has been a call for a recorded vote. We will... We will begin again with Ms. LeBlanc. No. Ms. Adams. Yes. Mr. Irving. No. Ms. Miller. No. Mr. Horn. No. Ms. D. Costanzo. No. Mr. LeBlanc. We. Oui. Ms. Coombs. No. The chair votes no. Motion defeated. Just bear with me here. Uh, so, um, yeah, okay, we, we've got a uh, request for another motion. Ms. Adams, please. Well, in the interest of time where I won't get to the third motion, I am going to bring a motion forward from the PC caucus for the health committee to write a letter to the Speaker of Hosts asking for the legislature to resume. We're making this motion because in this calendar year, the legislature has sat a grand total of 13 days. 10 of those days were to debate the budget. That's the mandatory 10 days. So we've literally had three days in this entire calendar year to ask government questions, to hold them accountable, to ask for clarity and to put forth ideas. Order, please. I'm going to rule this motion out of order on the basis that we do not have the capacity as a committee nor members to compel or direct the speaker. Uh, the speaker has the latitude and the ability to conduct, biz to conduct business, and as we as members and as co a committee do not have the purview to do so. So I'm going to rule that motion out of order. Is there any, f is there any further business? Ms. Adams, please. Yeah, no. Yeah. Okay. So one of the things that we are aware of is that Alberta and Ontario are piloting rapid testing at airports, even while they're struggling with widespread community transmission of the virus. We also know that they will test people who do not have symptoms. We are the last province to adopt the COVID alert app. So uh, as uh, put out in a press release by uh, PC leader Tim Houston, we are testing the second lowest per capita basis in Canada, only marginally ahead of Newfoundland and Labrador. Since October, the province has averaged 561 tests per day. Most new cases are a result of travel outside of the Atlantic bubble. And public health advisories for flight exposures have been issued on several occasions over the past few months, especially recently. And the government just recently changed the rules on um, seasonal workers coming back to the province. If the province has the extra testing capacity, there is no reason why we are not testing at airports. The point of entry testing is the logical next step for tracking the virus and preventing its spread in our province. We stress that we need to use our resources appropriately. So therefore, I would like to make a motion that our health committee write a letter to the new Minister of Health requesting that we implement COVID-19 testing at airports. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Is there any discussion on that motion? Oh, Ms. LeBlanc? I just have a question, Mr. Chair. Um, do we have to vote yes or no, or is there an option to abstain? 
there is an option to abstain. And um, therefore, can you just give us two minutes to deliberate? There's been a request for a two minute recess. I'm compelled to, as long as the committee is okay with it, oblige that. Sounds good. We'll reconvene at 2530. Okay, order, order, please. Uh, restate the motion. Oh, oh, I think there's more discussion here, Ms. Coombs. Thank you very much. Um, we feel that we need to trust public health, and there's more needed. There's more information needed with regards to this. So our caucus will be abstaining from the vote. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Adams. Well, I do appreciate the, the, the desire to trust public health, which of course we do. I will also make a comment that when I came back in from Toronto this summer, I walked straight off a plane from Toronto right through 300 people who were sitting waiting for flights to all across Canada. I was allowed to go to the bathroom, the canteen, the vending machines, and the places where you pick up the luggage before we were um, taken through the COVID screening. So there are still things um, that uh, can always improve. So I'd like to call for a recorded vote. Thanks. Uh, Mr. LeBlanc. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd also like just to re reiterate the point that if we were sitting in the legislature that we could ask the minister who is in fact charge of the delivery and access of health care, who is in fact char in charge of public health and public health is accountable to that minister, we could ask that minister these very questions that we are trying to get answers to uh, today. Thank you. Mr. Irving, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it's, again, very important that all MLAs uh, be part of the solution here. And public health has uh, been leading us with professional, thoughtful and compassionate leadership. And to undermine Nova Scotia's trust in public health with motions like this, I think is very disappointing. I think we as MLAs, uh, for all Nova Scotians need to put our full faith in public health. They are the experts on this. We as politicians are by no means the experts. And to say because something happened in July and the earliest parts of this epidemic is a reason to question public health direction in this province uh, is very, very disconcerting. So we will not be supporting this motion. Thank you. Further discussion, Ms. LeBlanc.
Thank you. I just want to um, say that I agree with my colleague uh, from the Liberal Caucus uh, who just spoke. And also, I agree with my colleague from the PC Caucus and reiterate the fact that this discussion would not need to happen like this or could happen in a much more fulsome way in a debate in the legislature were we permitted to sit and do our jobs. Thank you. Ms. Adams, please. And as a health professional, I want to remind everyone that Alberta and Ontario are already piloting rapid testing at airports. So it isn't that we don't trust public health, which of course we do. It is the fact that there are sometimes better things coming that we can learn from other provinces. And as a health professional who's worked in Ontario as well as Halifax, I can say we can always do better. And so we always want to look at other opportunities. And had we been sitting in the legislature, we could have had this discussion instead of making a motion. So I'm gonna call for the recorded vote now. Thank you, folks. There's been a call for a recorded vote. I'll begin again with Ms. LeBlanc. I abstain. Ms. Adams. Yes. No. Mr. Irving. Mr. No. Uh, Ms. Miller. No. Um, Mr. Horn. No. Ms. DiCostanzo. No. Mr. LeBlanc. Oui. Ms. Coombs. Abstain. Chair votes no. Uh, that concludes committee's business for today. Our next meeting will be Tuesday, December 8th of this year, 1 to 3 p.m. Our witness will be Dr. Stephen Bede regarding the ongoing work with organ and tissue donation. Uh, so, so I'm, so I'm hearing the the. Uh, issue about back-to-back -back Liberal Caucus agenda items. That was a decision that was made at the discretion of the clerk based on scheduling. And that concludes government or uh, committee business for the day.